recording right now. Hello, um, this is Chazan Matthew Klein. Thank you to everyone who's on this call this morning, whether you are coming in um, from the uh, telephone or from your uh, video screen. Um, this is uh, live from Bethel, and we're very happy to bring you the second week of presentations on uh, Pesach. Uh, today, I'd actually like to discuss, uh, by, first, by the way, um, if you have questions throughout the uh, the talk and the, the shear today, please write them in the chat. I'm writing hello in the chat. You can see it on the bottom. Um, I'll be muting uh, everyone's sound right now just uh, because we will probably have time for muted uh, or unmuted uh, calls but a little later. But actually, I prefer any questions you have, please actively put them in the comments uh, if you can. You're probably wondering, at the, around, worrying about this time, the fact that we have Pesach in just a few weeks, and you're going to have guests. And so today's uh, shiur is about a guest that you probably have every single year, and I'm going to sing about him for just a minute right now. Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Atishmi. Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hakiladi, Bimhera Biyamenu, Yavo Eleinu, Imashiach Ben David, Imashiach Ben David, Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu Hatishmi, Eliyahu, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hagiladi. So, of course, the guest that we'll be speaking about today is Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. Now, we probably don't think about it a lot because most of the time we think about Elijah has to do with that one cup, you know, that kind of Santa Claus moment that we have on our Seder every year where we have the cup with the wine, the kids go to the door, you spill out a little of the wine. I was so angry at my parents when I learned that they did that. But anyway, I don't know how you do it in your home. But one thing interesting I've realized in preparing for today is that Elijah is a way more frequent guest than we normally think. Example, Elijah shows up pretty much like a member of your family at almost all major Jewish family occasions. Number one, Elijah shows up at Havdalah, that is at the end of Shabbat every week. So you can think about that as you do it as a family. Or you could think about it when you or your kids go to Jewish summer camp. That is the one of the main singing moments. It's such a highlight. Everyone after they finish, they go right into Shavuot Tov and then into Eliyahu Hanavi, which we just sang. Now, what are those words all about? It says Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Elijah the Tishbeite, Eliyahu Hagiladi, Eliyahu from Gilead. So very quickly in our days, may he come upon us, may come to us, Im Mashiach ben David, with the Messiah, the son of David. So, number one, summer camp and Shabbat, Elijah is recalling uh, the Messianic era, that he will bring in and usher in this beautiful day. Hmm. Let's continue, though. Number two, so he's at summer camp, he's at Havdalah, he's also at your bar mitzvah. I didn't know if we, he got an invitation, but he showed up anyway, just like Pesach. And how do we know this? It says, uh, in the, if you'll remember, the third blessing of the Haftarah, blessings after the Haftarah, that is. Your kid will certainly remember, and you may too. Samecheinu Adonai Eloheinu Be'eliyahu Hanavi Avdecha U'malchut Be'david Meshichecha Bimhera Yavo Be'ageli Be'inu This means... Make us joyful, Adonai, our God, with Elijah the prophet, your servant, and with the kingdom of the house of David, your Messiah. Once again, very, very quickly, may he come upon us and our hearts will be super happy and dance. 
Um, so again, here, the same image of the Messianic era, the house of David, Elijah's going to bring that. Um, and he's bringing it on your bar mitzvah too. So, Havdalah, end of Shabbat, Jewish summer camp, your bar mitzvah. Uh, Elijah is also invited, if you remember, to your son's bris. Taking a look here on our source sheet, which I'm posting uh, for you internet people. Um, if you, if someone could, uh, if they're online, can just give me a little text to tell me that they can see uh, this shared screen. Uh, if you remember from the bris, a little chair, this is an ornate picture of it, uh, called the Kise Eliyahu. Eliyahu. Thank you, Marcy. Appreciate it. Um, and the uh, the person officiating will say, This is the chair of Elijah of blessed, blessed memory. He showed up at your kid's bris. Go figure. Then the person will say, I have awaited your salvation, O God, and desire it. I have observed your commandments, etc., etc. And then again, Eliyahu Malachabrit, Hinei Shalechalefanecha, Amod al Yemini Vesamecheni. Elijah, it's his angel, uh, Malachabris, right? The, the, the Bris angel, it's an interesting title. Uh, here is what is yours before you. Stand to my right and support me. So for those of you with a, a maybe like a Buddhist background, it seems like Elijah, more than even just the Messianic era, is kind of like a, a bodhisattva. He's coming back and being your intermediary, your helper uh, at this liminal moment in your child's life and in your life. Um, so again, Eliyahu has showed up at a ton of stuff. He showed up at your summer camp, at the bar mitzvah, at Shabbat at the end, at the bris, and of course, at the Seder, when we have Elijah's cup. Now, uh, a little thing about Elijah's cup. Interestingly enough, if you look at the text of the Haggadah, you'll notice that they're actually, um, other than the instruction to fill Elijah's cup and to open the door, there actually isn't any Mishnah text, any Haggadah text that's really about Elijah. The custom of having an Elijah's cup, actually, I learned from one of my favorite books. This is my one of my two reading rainbow moments today. I learned from the Shechter Haggadah. It's wonderful and nearly out of print. So if you want a really beautiful intellectual and lovely translation with pictures and great commentary, um, the Shechter Haggadah is by Dr. Joshua Kulp, who is a relative of a family in the synagogue. Um, so uh, Dr. Kulp teaches that really the Middle Ages is the first time we even get any um, any instance of this custom of having Elijah's cup. Uh, one, there are multiple explanations. Um, one one is that uh, from a, I think a 17th century rabbi is that according to Jewish law, you're not supposed to drink out of a partly you know a, a wine glass. Personally, you're supposed to down all your wine at once. You're not supposed to drink wine out of a partially filled glass. So everyone would take their cup of wine and pour it, the dregs of it from their last cup of wine, into this shared cup. But eventually, that got associated with Elijah. Now, we could spend more than the 21 minutes we have on why, uh, on the connection with this paragraph, Shvo Chamatcha, you'll pour out your wrath and, and the... Um, uh, that is asking God to um, have vengeance on the nations for all the schmeisting they do of us and for fixing the world uh, so where that doesn't happen. Uh, and there's a connection you can make between the messianic thing that Elijah brings in Jewish lore and, and legend to the uh, the perfected world envisioned by Shvochamacha, by that paragraph. So all this being said, we have a little sense of what Elijah is about. But the main point is, uh, that I think we're exploring for the next 15 minutes, is who is this guy? And why is he showing up at all of my family events? So to get a sense of this, we've, number one, we've had a little bit of mindfulness today on how much Elijah shows up in Jewish life. Number two, we're going to learn a little bit about his original character in the Bible and how he got to be this kind of family member that shows up at all the major Jewish simchas. And then we're going to just hopefully gain a little bit of wisdom for our Seder this year and for really just, I hope, daily life and engagement as a human being and a Jew uh, from the learning we do. So I'm going to try all of that in 20 minutes. Woo. By the way, if you have questions or if you need me to speak slower, um, you can please just type it in the message below. Um, let's continue on. 
a little about who is this guy, Elijah. Now, Elijah, Eliyahu, Manavi, explodes onto the scene primarily in the book of Kings. He, his um, life story and his work take up a huge swath of text between, I think, about King, 1 Kings 17 and 2 Kings 2. It's a big chunk. It's the major narrative, um, uh, internal narrative of the book. And Elijah shows up at a time of deep uh, difficulty in terms of the, f- the relationship between Israel and God, um, because a, a, a second loving God partner has been introduced. There's sort of a, a, a horrible triangle. We have the people of Israel, we have God, Hashem, and we have Baal, who is a major cult figure in, uh, in Mesopotamia. And the king of the time, Ahab, uh, already has some questionable literary associations today. Uh, king Ahab, King Ahab, has a wife, Jezebel, who's really, really into the Baal thing and really makes a space for it in the public sphere. And uh, and as you know, uh, Hashem el Kana, God is a jealous God and doesn't like idolatry at all. So a little bit about Elijah, who explodes onto this scene. And I'm going to take you to the uh, the text as quoted here. All right. Okay. Hopefully you can see this. Who is Elijah? Now, Elijah, the Tishbite, right? Hatishbi, Hatishbi in Gilead, Hagiladi, right? Says to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So you can sort of imagine this guy. It's almost very uh, Charlton Heston. (laughs) He comes before the king and says, No rain. God's doing it, except by God's word, you ain't going to have rain anymore. Very strong figure. And we see also in the second source listed here, Ahab and Elijah have a, um, Ahab sends some people out to kill him. There's like a whole thing. And Ahab sees Elijah and says, very gunslinger style, is it you, you troubler of Israel? Um, you might as well say, you. is it you, pilgrim? And he answers, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baalim. Now, therefore send and gather all of Israel to meet at Mount Carmel. It doesn't say at high noon, but we might as well add at high noon. And the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, another idolatrous figure um, of that period, who eat at Jezebel's table, that is your wife's table. So. Elijah is not only strong, he is very confrontational and very zealous for God. He sets up a gigantic, um, like the Thunderdome of religious showdowns between the prophets of Baal and Asherah and God. Um, You can guess who wins. Uh, By the way, you may recognize this story if you or your child or your parent had a bar or bat mitzvah for Parshat. Pinchas. Uh, this happens closer to the summer. Uh, Parshat Pinchas is the parsha with a very strong connection to this because in Parshat Pinchas, there is a similar threat to the faith of Israel from Baal. And we have the scene where uh, the the Midianites, or the, Moab, the Moabites, uh, come in and they send a bunch of cult prostitutes to go and seduce everybody. It's like a, a frat party and a, 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 you know, bacchanal gone horribly wrong. Uh, and you have a prince of Israel mm-hmm. and a princess of Moab coming together and being very intimate in a very inappropriate place, like right by the Holy of Holies. Complete breakdown in Israelite leadership. It is a mess. And then Pinchas comes in and he impales and stabs the two of them and God is happy. Now, this is a very challenging story uh, in a contemporary context. But what's true about Pinchas is he gets a little reward. He becomes a priest. You can argue about whether it's because he was a violent dude and they needed to pacify him. Um, But Pinchas is very zealous for God and acts at a time of massive idolatry. And indeed, if you spend some time with the Elijah story, you will notice that Elijah is being paralleled very directly to two people, Moses, who we'll get to, and Pinchas. And it is no mistake that this is the Haftarah for Pinchas that is from Elijah's story. So, back to our text. What else do we know about Elijah? Strong dude, 
very justice oriented, very faith oriented, uncompromising, um, willing to confront power. If you think about him as a Moses figure, um, uh, Ahab is his Moses is his Pharaoh. Um, he also, by the way, has a forty days and forty nights thing. He has a sea splitting moment. The the text of uh, Kings is very very um, making a ton of allusions, bringing Elijah as a Moses figure. Um, we also know he happens to be a hairy dude. Uh, Second Kings, he's a hairy man, wears a leather belt. Not sure what the leather belt thing means. Someone probably knows. Um, actually, I'll get to a, another. My second reading rainbow moment will be later, so stay tuned. And also, apparently he's a big runner. He runs a gigantic distance. So you runners out there, you have uh, an, a, um, a forerunner in Elijah. And that actually, the running thing will come back in just a second. So Elijah, in summation, really strong guy, really uncompromising. Not a... Uh, not a not a warm fuzzy guy, not a teddy bear, um, willing to confront power directly, uncompromisingly, strongly, create and and likes the big show, right? He orchestrates this gigantic show with the prophets of Baal uh, and the prophets of Asherah. Um, those of you who know uh, the oratorio, the uh, the Handel oratorio, um, um, or the Haydn oratorio. Oh, I'm going to be kicking myself after this for for not knowing the answer. Um, uh, the uh, no, sorry, it's the Mendelssohn oratorio. Elijah, thank God. All right, thank you. Um, the Mendel Snoratorio Elijah, this scene is a little nicer, um, but it's a big, big scene. Main point is, uh, Elijah has his ups and his downs, and we learn a little more about this in this next source. So Elijah, um, the big show doesn't work. And I maybe, if you learn anything about from Elijah's story, it's that uh, uses of, and shows of power are not really the way for long-term success with inspiring people to worship God or really to change their lives. Doing the big, you know, whatever the big show, the big television special, the big thing doesn't do the long-term work. And Elijah finds this out the hard way and God teaches him. Elijah says to God, God, I want to die. My work isn't successful. Jezebel's after me. And now we get to our quote. And Elijah says, "Go." For God says, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. By the way, this is Mount Horeb, which is the same as Mount Sinai. Moses and Elijah, highly parallel, very intentionally. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, that is, split them into, and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, you may remember this, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out, and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> so God is teaching Elijah that the big show, the mountain, the fire, the earthquake, the big show, that's not how the work is going to get done. You have to listen to God's voice and go out and get work done. And he actually takes Elijah to task, sends him back into his ministry. And Elijah actually does a decent amount of stuff from here until the end of his life. So maybe a lesson from Elijah really is um, uh, that um, study, that that spiritual, uh, spiritual engagement is, uh, is more effective at changing your life and changing who you are and being spiritually engaged and faithful to God than a big show of power. But. This isn't all of what we know about Elijah. We've really got a sense of his character. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, we're, I'm going to show a little of the transition of his character uh, into what we know today and a little take home for everyone here. So if you have questions, please throw them into the chat so that I can answer them later. Um, I'd be happy to. Okay, back to the text. Da, 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 da. As they continued walking, this is the famous Elijah passage. Elijah has a sidekick and a successor, Elisha. And they, mm -hmm. he's at the end of his life. And as they continue walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separate the two of them. With my runners out there for the chariot of fire reference. And Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. This is what I usually say when I when I see something really amazing. Um, but when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and <laughs> tore them into two pieces. So this is the death of Elijah. But Elijah, as you can see, doesn't really die. He is taken up into heaven. 
by the way, for those of you who remember the book of Deuteronomy, Moses also buried by God. So there's kind of a direct God end of life thing. Direct Moses parallel, very intentional. Now, this is where the myth about Elijah, where the, um, which is funny because the Bible in general, even though there are miracles and things like that, uh, the rabbinic principle of we don't rely on a miracle, really stands. And actually, we actually really learn it from Elijah's story. That the big miracles, the big shows, oh my gosh, nature has been upturned, um, doesn't actually change the people of Israel. It's the spirituality, it's the study, it's the inside stuff, not the big outside stuff that changes them. And, uh, but Elijah, and so the, the biblical writers are big into writing history. They're not as big into the big show. Um, but Elijah, his end of his life is a show that's too big to let go. And indeed, uh, we see later in, Ma, in the book of Malachi, uh, another Moses-Elijah parallel. Remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and the ordinances I, I commanded him at Choreb for all Israel. And then he says famously, lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. So Elijah now becomes a figure of the Messianic era, right? Toward the end of the Bible, end of the prophets in Malachi. And he's not technically, from what we know from his the, the little mythical part of his story in Kings, not technically buried. He's been taken up by God, so maybe he's not dead. And indeed, the mythos around what he's going, what Elijah's going to do in advance of the Messiah uh, gets taken forward by a Jewish writer, not a canonical biblical writer, but a Jewish writer nonetheless, Ben Sirach. And Ben Sirach says... Um, he has a big pie and a big thing about Elijah and how awesome he is. And this is one quote from him. He who was taken aloft in a whirlwind and with a fiery team heavenward, uh, who is, is written in its proper time, will pacify the anger of the Lord before it is turned to fury to turn the hearts of fathers to their children. We saw that before. And to restore the tribes of Jacob. So now we have Elijah bringing back not only uh, families together, and not only pacifying God and not only bringing the Messiah, but restoring, seeing him in the restoration of people to the land in the, in the really incoming, the exiles. So all this Elijah stuff, Elijah now from this point on will become a gigantic mythical figure because he's not technically dead. And because he is associated with the messianic age, he will become to be associated by the rabbis and indeed by all the things that we know from, you know, uh, Havdalah, Eliyahu, Hanavi. He'll be associated with all of the great things that, uh, that come uh, with uh, all the great things that the rabbis think are great. He'll become a super rabbi. There'll be tons more midrashim, more stories about Elijah than pretty much any other biblical figure um, in the Talmud. He will be a person who is um, lets heavenly secrets out. His voice will come. We see in this source, um, I'll just do the last source I have here, uh, you know, Rabbi Yosef was traveling on the road. He enters a uh, Jerusalem ruin to pray, and Elijah comes and waits for him until he's done davening. And after he's after he's done davening, he says, "You know, peace be upon you, my master." Elijah looks like he's talking to him like a rabbi talks to another rabbi. It's amazing, right? And then there's a little halacha about why did you go into this ruin? Oh, I learned some halacha from Elijah, um, and all that and uh, all that uh, jazz. So, Marcy, I see you have a question. I'll get to the end of my thought, and I will get to it. Um, so, Elijah, he will become a super rabbi. He will solve halachic problems. He will help people in need. Again, the bodhisattva thing comes back. Um, and indeed, for those of you who are, are a little familiar with, like, the Zohar and Jewish mysticism, Elijah is the person who he becomes the mystical figure par excellence. He is said to have revealed the Zohar, which is like the Bible of Jewish mysticism, to Shimon Bar Yochai to the person who allegedly wrote the whole Zohar. Um, so Elijah will become a major figure for coming into the lives of Jews and for heralding the Messianic era and for being the symbol of everything good that is to come. And he will have a ton of fanfic that is Midrash written about him, um, which is interesting because it's just a little bit different from what we have about him originally. Now, Marcy has a question. I'll read it out loud, and I will then I'll, I'll conclude and uh, and give a chance for any other questions. Uh, so, um, what Marcy adds that um, I should not know much about Elijah before today. Why is this story not better known? 
Um, is there supposed to be a discussion about him when he shows up at all these family events? Um, great question, Marcy. I, I think that um, I, I think I had that realization too when I was preparing for today. Like, wow, um, we don't really talk about Elijah that much, other than oh yeah, here's his wine. I think that has a lot to do with how much we think about the Messiah, because Elijah is really associated with this messianic vision, and so I think maybe I don't think um, anyone's to blame in particular for the fact that we don't really talk about um, mess messianic stuff, although maybe the way that Christians talk is different than us, so we were sensitive to that. Um, but I think that we can use this as an opportunity, and one of my take-homes for today is that um, when we're at the Seder, let's talk about what world we envision. Because really, Elijah's here to symbolize what is the kind of world that we envision, and that when we open the door um, with, for Elijah we're at the Seder, let's have a moment to say, what are we really opening the door for? Um, there's a wonderful uh, song by a band that came to Bethel called Izuz. And, uh, you know, in, in Judaism, we're, we're waiting for the Messiah, but also the Messiah could be sort of any one of us. The song goes like this. It's by Jesse Romer, who's the daughter of Sue Romer, uh, who was uh, a cantor and, a, and a, a service leader and a musician in the area. She's in the Fabrengan Fiddlers. Uh, so Jesse, who's a renewal cantor, sings... <laughs> Eliyahu Hanavi, Eliyahu Hatishbi, Eliyahu Hagiladi, Efo Eliyahu, Eliyahu Baroshi, Eliyahu Balibi, Eliyahu Banishmati, Hine Eliyahu, Hine Eliyahu. Great song. Look up um, Eliyahu Hanavi, Izuz, Easy Uzi. Um, that song means um, Eliyahu, where is he? He's in my head, he's in my heart, and he's in my soul. So another vision of what the Messianic era could be is realizing our importance to God and realizing that we are helping to realize the Messianic vision with the basic mitzvot, the basic acts of loving kindness, of prayer, and of study that we do in every day. So maybe that's one way we can bring a mindfulness, and maybe I'll do that song at my Seder this year. I think Alyssa's on the on this uh, webcast. And by the way, she really helped me in preparing this. So thank you, honey. Um, so uh, that's uh, number one. And in conclusion, uh, another thing I think that we can see, because really the contrast between Elijah, zealous, Pinchas dude, super confrontational, super like stark, um, not not warm and fuzzy at all, and the totally warm and fuzzy Eliyahu comes to every single event that we have. He drinks wine, he's at the bris, he's at the bar mitzvah, he's at Shabbos, he's at everything. Um, I think that the, the realization I came to is that I think we can learn a lot from both reality and idealized parts of people. That is to say, the idea, the, the figures in our lives who are really meaningful to us, you can think of major figures like JFK or Martin Luther King even, or George Washington. The ideals that they symbolize, you know, whether even if it's George Washington and the cherry tree, are really worthy of looking at, and they're really important. But we should also study the original story because that teaches us stuff too. And I think that's true about Elijah. Um, if you really want to study Elijah in depth, my favorite book, um, it's called The Elijah Enigma by Hillel I. Milgram. Um, I'll write that into the message, The Elijah Enigma. It's on Amazon. And he really goes just verse by verse. Uh, this is my rabbi in Israel, a very close friend. Um, just writing it into the comments as in our last minute. Uh, really good book about Elijah and the meaning of his ministry and the whole, it's very close study. Um for lay people, but but nice and academic. It has a nice little intellectual edge to it, which I love. Um, but I think that we can learn uh, really about from the way that we idealize figures in our lives and looking at who they really are, um, because both of them teach us complementary things. Um, you know, some people, if they see that a, a figure is idealized but had this horrible past, like, oh, this guy never freed his slaves. Oh, this guy was like this. Um, we have a tendency to reject people because they had a past that we don't like so much. Um, but I think this is a real invitation that we can learn from the difficult and different parts of a person's real life, the biography of anybody famous, I think. Um, but also, we can still learn from the ideals from which they stand for. And in some ways, uh, Elijah, his rabbinic, you know, fan fiction image of this messy guy leading to the messianic era and the type of dude he was in his day both have things to teach us and i think that we should not uh pick one but really be inclusive of both with the figures that we have in our lives that we idealize um and with the uh the figures in our torah that are here to teach us um whether in the bible or at our seder so 
thank you so much. If you want a recording, it's 1231. I appreciate your time. Uh, this will be recorded if you want to share it with friends. Um, it'll be available on Bethel's website. I thank you for your time and have a Chag uh, Sameach V'chasher, a happy and kosher Passover. Come back next week, um, uh, the 29th, uh, for another teaching from, I think it's Rabbi Werben next week, and then from Itzik Sayag, our Shaliach, in the last week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. And by the way, if you have extra questions, please, uh, please feel free to email me. Thank you very much.